everything scares Josh. Everything. That's what's so funny. He, he understands the fear of everything. So that's why he writes about it. It's really brilliant because he takes that little quirky thing that you kind of like, what? And that's what he builds on. Having three boys, you almost have to be a drill sergeant in order to be successful with them because they're so close in age and they are all over the place. They would play I Spy and they would go into people's houses and sneak around the house, neighbors' houses, to try and spy on people. One time, while this family was having dinner, Josh and his little brother were in the pantry hiding. And somebody said they needed ketchup and it was in the pantry. And Josh said, I was never so scared in my life that they'd open up that pantry door and I'd have to explain. I think he was like maybe eight. I mean, real little guy. And um, then someone said, oh no, we have ketchup, it's right here. And then when everybody left, they got out of the house and they supposedly never did it again. So I played in this uh, like Jewish basketball like travel league. One year we won the tournament, whatever, and then I was like so excited about it that I was I was like I got I got to write this down. I got to write down this experience. I just like went 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 like all in one night. Wrote what amounted to like a forty page recap of this really exciting basketball tournament. And it wasn't until like years later, years later, where I realized like, man, like in high school I. Like a three page paper sounded like a lot, you know? And here I was like, just rattled off 40 pages. But to like just write because you're inspired or uh, just because you're so freaking excited about it. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was, ama it, was, it, it was probably one of the most like pure artistic experiences of my life. And it was writing about like a basketball tournament in Ohio. After my freshman year of college, I moved back home with my mom. And then I had drums set up in the basement. And Josh and I, we were just friends, so anyone that we knew that played music, we would have over. And we're like, well, you're here. You should also be playing music. And that's kind of it, you know? I wasn't there, but another friend took him to like Gordy's and bought him an organ. And then now he played the organ. <laughs> like, it was all very simple, you know? So my friends had bought me this Farfisa organ because they were all playing music. And they're like, hey, you write, you know, and, and we all hang out every day. You know, this is like 17-year-old logic. Like, you should just join our band even though you don't know how to play music, right? But you can play the organ. Here, here's a C chord, here's a G chord, right? And so I did. I started playing C and G. And our friend Mark Owen came over. We knew we liked music, but we didn't know how to play it. I remember taking one of the notebooks and just opening it to a random page and starting to sing the poems that he had written. I guess they were poems or lyrics. And it was horrible. <laughs> but it got better, of course, as we started to take it more seriously. And, but at that point, we were just, we just wanted to play. We just wanted to make music in the basement. Well, the thing that we were doing in East Lansing kind of dissolved. I moved, I moved to New York because I always wanted to live in a big city. And I didn't see Detroit as being like an answer to what I wanted. And then after being in New York for a year, I was like, I miss the guys, you know? So I, I'm like, I'm going to convince them to move here too. Before we went to New York, we set up shop in Josh's father's garage and recorded every day there on the four track and tried to make songs and talked about music and life. And you know, one vivid memory I have is playing a tape of ours in a, uh, just Josh and I sitting in a parking lot and, and just listening to what we had just recorded. We were ecstatic about it. 
and we're excited. We want to go to New York and play and um, and play with Derek. Death for us is a mixture of moods. It's like true love to a degree. A rain puddle after a storm bent on becoming. Well, Josh and Mark would send me tapes and I would listen to them. I would get ideas, you know, in my mind of what I would want to play on them. And I wanted them to come to New York so we could record together again. Derek could have moved to Boise. He could have moved to Oxford, Mississippi. He could have moved to Seattle. Wherever Derek went, we probably would have followed him there. We were figuring out how, how, to, uh, how to make music how to live in the world, actually. We were so young, you know. And the truth is that we didn't go because it was some kind of scene in any way. We, Josh was so sort of oblivious, any kind of scene. Josh just wanted to play, you know, wanted to make music. The move to New York was just really to, to continue the band, but we were also, you know, young artists who were just like realizing that you know you could write and record anything you want, and so there was a sense of um, what's out there. What you know, there was the what's in the big city for me. So Mark and I did this thing we called a write-in, and we were like, okay, we're gonna come home, we're gonna lock the door Friday night in our apartment in New York, and we have to write 100 pages by Monday morning. We got like a couple bottles of whiskey, lunch meat, just repeat drinks, repeat clacking of the typewriter, go, 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 for like 48 hours, whatever it was. And in that next 48 hours, I wrote a 100-page novella. Well, I thought that we would write a short story, or a long letter, or something like that. Monday morning comes around, and Josh has a novella written that he called Orgy. And the only reason it's called Orgy is, I mean, God, I wish it was about an orgy, but it's not. The only reason it's called Orgy is because it felt like an orgy of, um, of the imagination. You know, like, like go, go, go for however, for two straight days in a locked apartment. It was like, it was like an orgy going on inside of my mind or something. Chad Stocker is two years younger than me and had grown up good friends with my kid brother, Ryan. And Chad is a really good bass player. And I was still in Michigan. Uh, going to school at Eastern Michigan University. Josh was the designated guy who would call me like maybe once a week for a bunch of months. And I was like, man, you should, you should drop out. You should drop out, you should join us. Like, where would you rather, would you wanna be like at, you know, you wanna like finish college? You wanna be in a rock band out in like a big city right now? Like, come on, let's go. And I knew better than to fall for that bait. But really the minute I, I graduated, um, college. Uh, within three weeks, I was on my way to Atlantic City to see a band play. And I was, you know, just hounding him. And he never really gave us an answer one way or the other. And then months later, a knock at our, um, you know, loft door. And Chad was, Chad had come to New York. We went out for a drink that night, <laughs> you know, and I was like, I'm here. And that is how the High Strung started.
we kind of got done with our first tour and ended up kind of like, I don't know where we ended up, if we ended up in New York or ended up back in Detroit. We were like, that was great. For it to mean anything, you have to just keep going back. Like you can't just play like one show in Atlanta and one show in Cleveland and be like, oh, I went on tour. You know, you have to like keep going back. And it just turned into, into like a whole thing. And I just liked, I, li I just liked it, you know? We weren't staying in hotels, you know? We were living off like $10 a day each. We were sleeping on people's floors. And I really kind of wouldn't have it any other way, you know? I remember Josh writing most when it was just uh, Chad, Josh, and I during the really long touring days. But a lot of the times it's like, you know, we get up, we get in the van, he'd be riding, I'd be driving, Chad would be sleeping, we get to where we're going, we unpack, and like, then our night begins again. We start, you know, the whole like rock and roll thing. Derek loves driving. He would drive like four, six hours a day, every gig, eight hours, whatever it was. He just, I think he just liked the roll and rhythm of it. And so sitting in the passenger seat, if we're on the road for the next four months, man, you want to write another book, like, why don't you try one here? Like, just while we drive, you got four hours ahead of you, right? Usually every gig was at least two hours apart, right? If it's an eight hour gig, find two hours to write, uh, read, you know, sleep, whatever you're gonna do. If it's a two hour gig, write the whole time. And, and then, but as long as you do that every day, you know, those numbers add up. I wrote about one or two pages of just this psychosexual horror, crazy horror story that happens in the woods. And 28 days later, just like, done. Done. 313 pages, handwritten. And I like, I like leapt out of my like chair, you know, when I realized, that, oh my God, this is, the end of, this is the end of a book. You don't have to, like, I didn't know exactly how it was gonna end, but I was like, wait, no, this is a great, place to stop, just stop, you're done, you're done. You just wrote a book. Just like I said earlier that writing that story about that basketball tournament was like, you know, like a seminal moment or something. Wendy was, was Wendy was a big one. Yeah, that was, because once that door was open, it was, I'm still swimming in the flood waters of that now, you know. Maybe it had to do with, you know, Mark quit the band and there was something, um, you know, traumatic about that. It was like, oh my God, I, 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 you know, this reality I don't like right now, I need to write my own. I wonder if that's, you know, if, if cutting that, you know, umbilical cord, you know, Wendy was that or something. I was a fan of the High Strung before I joined the band for probably five or six years. And I'd always kind of see them throughout the years and you know there was always this talk of like hey you should join the group because i was at every show that they, they ever played in detroit and uh you know before i knew it i was a member of the band I met Allison at the album release show of uh, The High Strung's Possible or Impossible. It's like our fifth album or something. I sometimes wear uh, war paint on my face, probably something I should still do, and I used to. And after the show, Derek's walking me out of the bar. I'm completely drunk. And suddenly a sprite pops up in front of me, all legs and eyes. This gorgeous, almost like mythic looking woman. And I said, hey, I really like your face paint. Do you think I could get some face paint too? And I'm like, oh, uh, of course you can. And I reach in my pocket for it. And as he's doing that, I grab his face and I rubbed it against mine. And I said, did it work? And that was it. Josh and I are similar in a lot of ways where obviously his imagination is pretty pretty wild and, and mine is also. Right after meeting Josh, 
was when I started to do a lot of like the body painting stuff. I had already done some, but then every time we'd be hanging out and drinking and just like being weird. And sometimes I would go and like paint myself up and he would constantly be like, hey, when are you gonna do that again? Like, that was cool, we should do that again. Like, he's, he's always been so supportive in that way. I wouldn't say that I intentionally didn't date an artist or something, but I used to think that, you know, I'll be the crazy artist in the couple, that kind of thing. Like, yeah, I could date, you know, a banker or whatever. It doesn't matter, right? Someone, but I had no idea how exciting it could be to date someone who also is as, who has like the same motor. Like every now and then we have to say to ourselves like, hey, maybe today we should just do nothing. You know, just watch like David Blaine videos today. <laughs> you want to just like watch like mad street magic today? Because if you think about it, what we're doing, how do you explain this? A lot of people may love their job, but this is like, you know, you're, I'm writing like not a novel all day. And what, what would I rather do? So, you know, if I had another job, I would excitedly come home and work on the book when I had some time. Well, I'm writing a book and at the end of the night, I sometimes think maybe it'd be a good idea to work on another one. Alice and I live a, an artist's life, you know? And I don't, I don't think that I was fully immersed in that until I started living that with like another artist. I do portraits of animals and people uh, in any different medium you can imagine. It's kind of more of a photorealistic sort of style. And then I also sing sort of like jazz standards and songs from like the 30s, 40s. And, and Josh is always right there anytime I have a, a gig. She did the cover art for Goblin. We made a movie together, like a just wild, crazy potty humor movie. Hello, is anyone there? Who the hell are you? You know, some people are like born inspired or something. You know, some people are born aware of how little time or how much time there is, you know, to be alive and like, why not? Why would I ever spend any of it doing anything but like this amazing thing that her and I like discovered, you know? It's hard for me to say where Bird Box came from in any way. And the reason why is because the, the rules I make for myself essentially are, hey, you finish one story, let's start writing the next one. And that doesn't belittle one or the other. It's just like, what are you gonna do today instead, right? Let's write, let's have fun, let's go. Bird Box was just the next story to write. You know, I liked the image of a mother blindfolded with two kids blindfolded traveling down a river. I just liked that idea. And then it struck me that I did not know what they were fleeing from, what they couldn't see, you know? And so I, I made it probably 20 or 30 pages in, and then I started to think about, um, there was a teacher in high school who had told us, told the class that, um, that a man could go mad if he even tried to contemplate infinity. We can't fathom infinity because our minds are ill-equipped. And so I came home that day from school and I was, I was really shaken up about what the teacher said. I remember like saying to myself, hey, don't think about where time begins. Don't, don't think about where space ends. Like, don't do it, don't do it. And there was a moment there where I actually felt like I saw, like I glimpsed like the madness that the teacher was talking about. I, I, I had like a, just like a freak out. Years later, I'm working on Bird Box. I have this mom blindfolded and these two kids blindfolded in this canoe. And I'm like, oh man, what if they can't look at infinity? What if infinity were personified in some way or another and it's with them on this river and they cannot even look at it because that would be the equivalent of trying to fathom it. And that, I mean, that was it, man. The book wrote itself from there. It was just an explosion from there. The idea of me at a podium just reading from the book just sounded so boring to me. Instead, I got the band together to play a horror movie soundtrack. Allison played the role of Mallory, and we blindfolded the audience. And essentially, it, it turned into more of a, a performance piece or something closer to horror theater than, than a reading. 
And with Black Mad Wheel, it's it's even gone. I think it's probably gone up a step. Where now there is now there are costumes, and stage props, and a pre-recorded soundtrack. And I feel like Alice and I are knocking on Grand Guinal's door right now. We are knocking on the door of horror theater. And I think the fantasy now is with Goblin and Beyond on Barry Carroll that it's actually actors acting out the scene and I'm just directing them. I think that his writing career is like, I feel like it's just taking off now. I mean, it was, it was like unbelievable that he wrote, I think it was like 16 books without ever shopping a single one or really talking about, outwardly at least, about publishing them. And then as soon as uh, someone got a hold of one and like, you know, kind of put it out there, it, he get, got picked up right away. It was just amazing, you know? And he's always been into numbers, you know? And I think he wants to have good stats when it's all over, <laughs> you know? Like he wants to have a lot, you know? He doesn't want to have like one or, you know, one or two books or, you know, he wants to have a lot. Some of the things he talks about in, the, in his writing are just things that he talks about. I think that's what draws people to Josh because he makes people feel comfortable with their weirdness. I'm comfortable with Josh and my weird, you know, like we talk about weird stuff and it's, you know, he doesn't judge people because he's weird too. <laughs> you know, one thing I remember is, you know, Josh lived with me for a few months and I saw all of these hard copies of uh, his books that he had written over the years and they were just the stack of, you know, different uh, books that he had written. And I was just like, wow, man, this guy is just so prolific and that he's doing this along with the music, which is wildly prolific. It was just a bit mind blowing. Josh and I both talk about the fact that neither of us are necessarily creating to, you know, we're not trying to get to that point of making the most perfect masterpiece of a work of art. It's not about the one perfect thing, it's about the, the body of work itself. And besides just who he is as an individual and as an artist, I, I have no doubt that it'll keep on growing until, until his fingers stop working. It's not all about 
how big or famous he is or accomplished. That's a better word. I like that word better, accomplished, because he is accomplished. And in all the areas that he chooses to go into, but he's it's the kindness that shines through. A lot of these people get into these um, modes of success, and success to them is money. To Josh, it's success is people. And, and he loves listening to your story or your story, my story. He loves that. And I think the kindness of that success. And he's got that. And I'm really happy. All three of them have that. And I have no idea how they got it. But I'm grateful. I think uh, one wonderful byproduct of being an artist is that you, you know, knowingly or not, you end up documenting a lifetime. As so long as you uh, work regularly, you know, if you put out one book like Margaret Mitchell, Gone with the Wind, if you put out one book, you know, maybe it's more of a statement or more of a, a shining moment or something like that. But if you work regularly, you know, you get to, in hindsight, you get to actually watch your philosophy um, change and grow. You get to like watch yourself grow up. And it's a different thing than looking through like a series of photos. Because we all can kind of be like, oh, my God, I look so young. But it's a much different thing to think like, oh, my God, I thought so young. And here's real proof of it. And also, you know, some of that young thinking was like very interesting. You know, oh, I hadn't, you know, hadn't thought about this or that since then. You know, and we're all I'm of a mind that we're all young till we die. I'm of a mind that we're all, you know, beautiful till we die. You know, and anytime someone says, you know. You know, oh, do I, I, I look bad today, or I, I look bad in this, like, photo or whatever. I, it makes me want to, like, go, like, dig up a dead body and show, hey, look at this. Now how do you look? <laughs> you know? You look great, man. Let's go. So one of the joys, one of the great joys of being an artist, and particularly a manic artist, is that this review of, you know, a philosophical life, which e everyone has just by virtue of being alive. And I think that in my case... Like what I've, you know, what I've seen, it, it, it goes back to the, you know, to the first long story I told you I wrote, Orgy. And how the reason I titled that Orgy was because it was an orgy of the imagination. It was an orgy of inside a skull. And I think that, you know, that same, you know, I, I could title the whole canon Orgy. I could title all the books together and all the songs together in like one quilt of delirium. You can call that whole thing orgy for the same exact reason, you know. And hopefully, when I'm the dead body that someone digs up to show someone how good you look, hopefully, you know, I can maintain this all the way, all the way up to then. <laughs>